John. And um, I think we, we should take a few minutes to um, just comment and discuss on, on that uh, topic because it raised quite a lot of issues and we're delighted to see you get a little bit of pedagogy in there as well um, to, to, to help us to think about how best to use some of these tools. Anyone want to ask John anything? Kevin. I, don't, I hate to ask such a specific and nerdy question, but I'm fascinated that it's like that you gave the students in the course a kind of a homework kit, as including the microscope. How expensive mm -hmm. was that microscope to be introduced? Oh, no, it wasn't. Um, I think we latterly we've been using USB microscopes, which are just sort of um, 30, 40 pounds or something. And I think previously they were, they were short, small field microscopes, which may have been, I'm not sure, 100 to... 150 something like that but so they, they weren't expensive but it was just to enable them to do a certain amount of um, sim simple field work. Yeah. At other points the, the Open University used to send the, the geology students a box this big with rock specimens, fossil specimens, a full proper pet petrological microscope through the post um, but then the students had to post it back again to do their apprentice. But in the last few years, they've been going to digital microscope, which is just a matter of, all, I suppose, expensive to develop. Once it's developed, it's a matter of just printing a CD, and, and also you can get it online. So these things are becoming a little bit easier, I think. Mm -hmm. And it really, the practical work, I think, is really about pedagogy and that is um, I suppose you know locking people in from working position of getting to know what you need to know from a work position does that not close down the whole speculative little bit of you know opening it I mean sure we don't come in and just shock people with you know that um, banking model of mm -hmm. education mm -hmm. but um, just in terms of leaving things open and exposing to them to things that they wouldn't have otherwise is that yeah, no, I, I. I'm not sure how to that balance. I, I agree. You, you've kind of got to. You've also got the responsibility of trying to nudge people into things which they weren't necessarily yeah. interested yeah. Or, or, or what have you. Um, so I'm not necessarily advocating an entirely, you know, sort of just you know, purely um, sort of demand driven education system. I certainly wouldn't want to see that. Um, but equally, people do kind of learn much faster, I think, when they're learning something they know they need to know about. So we have, we have to, you know, it's a question of how do we balance these things and how do we, we, we play them off. I, don't, I, I think there's certainly a role for, for, for both approaches. But, uh, yeah. I think maybe assessment drives the tool, doesn't it? Because if the assessment encourages informal learning mm. and so on, well then that's going to mean that they will engage in informal learning. But if the assessment Yeah, I think um, assessments have got a lot to answer for, in a sense, in terms of the way they, they prepare people for for the real world of work, I should say. Mm. Mm. I think that there's a, there's a lot of scope for that, that sort of project, so I don't know if you want to add anything, Gavin, whereby it doesn't look like, once you have some resources, it doesn't look like it should necessarily cost a lot of money. But, um, I don't know, what, what did you mainly spend the money on? Um, the main expense was taking the students to Rhodes. <laughs> that, was the, that, was the, that was the real expense. <laughs> which, which is a very valuable experience. Which, yeah. which, which was anyway, yes, yeah. because obviously they were also, as research students, they were also able to participate in the, in the academic conference. Yeah. Um, so that, that was the key thing which would be difficult to do otherwise. Um, but the encouraging thing was that um, you know, some of the big companies involved in the agriculture sector really, really sort of got quite excited about this because you know, what they saw was, was young people who were kind of very enthusiastic about uh, you know, coming up with new ideas and coming up with innovations and, and trying to get those into, into business and um, they felt that was quite a, a, you know, a, a good thing so they were willing to, they're potentially willing to put, put funding in themselves in the future so we're exploring that as a way of uh, con con continuity. So once you start you can 
Um, interaction with them. Yeah, they, there was um, four groups, uh, each of three people. Um, and that was really dictated by the budget for the conference, um, largely anyway. Um, we supported them um, in several ways. Firstly, through the Moodle site where we were providing them with materials. Uh, we also set up a, a discussion board there, but we found that people didn't didn't use it, maybe there wasn't enough people involved. Also in this particular case they were competing with each other and there was quite a strong driver there. It was they really wanted to, to win and they wanted to be the you know, so, so they didn't share as much between them as they might otherwise have done. Um, and um, then we also in addition to their uh, industry mentor, they also had a, an academic tutor who was kind of helping and supporting them as well. So, um, yes, there was, there, was, there was a sort of fair bit of support, but it, it varied between the teams as to exactly, exactly how much. Um, and, and, you know, most of the time it was, it was a part-time thing for six weeks. So we had two intensive days and then, you know, a few, uh, a few sort of one-hour sessions or so during the course. Um, 